Welcome back to Monroe Live. So most of the videos that you see us doing are vehicles that we have torn down that we have purchased ourselves to be able to have content to share with you. What you don't see are the vehicles or the products that we tear down for a customer or the conversations that we end up having with that customer. Uh, and that is where Monroe actually makes its money in the consultation, design consultation, costing consultation, planning consultation, all of those things. So I wanted to have a conversation about something I could talk about that did not risk any confidentiality with any of our current customers. So I picked some parts from one of my cars. This is from a 1961 vehicle. And I'm going to tell a story as if these were three different engineers and if they came to Monroe for consultation for their design. So we are going to talk about Bob. Bob is the expert for injection molding. Now this is 1959, 1960. Injection molded plastics are still very, very new. Bob is the expert and they have designed some guidelines of how an injection molded part would have to be designed. So this is the inside of his glove box. There is a hinge plane at the bottom and Bob knows that when this door opens and closes, he wants to have his pin as high up as he can because that will be the best spot for durability for when the glove box needs to stop. So Bob has designed his injection molded plastic. Then we have Jerry. Jerry is the expert in castings and he is making these brackets that go along the side of the glove box that that guide pin is going to ride in. This is going to mount to the crossbar beam and then to the vehicle top pad. Now for Jerry, he wants to have that track as deep within that casting as he can, because if he puts it towards the surface, he might risk it breaking. But we have a problem. You'll notice that in vehicle, this pin does not align with Jerry's casting. Also, Jerry has this metal tab. Now this metal tab is made from bent steel. There is a stud that is welded to that steel. It is then put to the bracket and then a bolt is tightened down. Why would he make that? Well, because Jerry wants some sort of tolerance. When he bolts this to his cross car beam and the top pad is coming in, it may come in a little crooked. He wants some fine tuned adjustment at that top surface. So by having that on a bolt, he can loosen up and change that angle so that he gets a perfect match to the vehicle as it is built. Okay, so Jerry has designed everything to his design guidelines for casting. Bob has designed everything to his best practices and design guidelines for injection molding. But these two don't know each other. So they go to the new guy. Now the new guy, he wants to impress Bob and Jerry. He also wants to be a problem solver. He wants to show to the big bosses within his company that he can solve their problems. So the new guy comes up with this. This is a thin stamping. We have a pin that is riveted to the stamping. We have this little nut, which is force fit into the metal and then it is peened to lock it in place. This fits to the hole that Bob has provided in the injection molding. And it offsets that pin so that it fits to the casting that Jerry has provided. Okay, so now management says, we need you all to get your heads together. We're getting ready to kick these things off for production tooling. We wanna to verify that we have made the right thing. Bob knows that he has designed everything to the perfect design guidelines that the company has prescribed. Jerry knows that he is within his design guidelines and that his tab is going to provide the flexibility that they need on the assembly line. The new guy, has now been able to impress Bob and Jerry because they don't have to change their designs and this system is going to work. This went into production in the fall of 1960. And then eventually they would come to a consultant or if someone internally saw it, they would come to us and I would say, all right, let's look at this pin. How many different parts, how many different processes went into making this pin? This pin fits to this glove box but there is no relative movement before the, between the pin and the glove box. There shouldn't be. All right, so why do we have this elaborate of a system? Also, this bracket, we know where our track is and we're saying that our track cannot be up there. Well, why don't we just move that pin down 
so that it's in the position that this pin would be in. Now we would make that claim and we would try and work that out between the engineers. And then there would be someone from management who would be there. The engineers would often get somewhat defensive. They worked very, very hard to make something that meet their design guidelines. That was if within the proper parameters, they did everything the right way. Okay, from their definition, they did everything the right way. Unfortunately, it's still a bad design. It's a costly design. So from that conversation, by at least March of 1961, management decided to put a new hole in Bob's glove box. They moved, you can see Bob's original hole. They moved the pin down and then just screwed it directly into the side of the glove box. Now, the best position would have been the top. However, this is still a good enough position to work. It does not cause any issues. Now, the other issue was a quality issue. Think about this. You see this rib in the glove box? That was put there to be an anti-rotation feature. When this is tightened down, every time the glove box opens and this pin hits the bracket, it's trying to rotate, 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 and it would dig into that plastic. So, unfortunately, Bob, your design was not the best design for the vehicle. It may have been the best design for your design guidelines, but this is costly for the entire vehicle. The new guy. Yes, you built something very impressive, and congratulations for being a problem solver. However, things that are impressive in design are often bad designs. This I would consider to be similar to a Rube Goldberg machine. It's a very, very fancy feature that solves the problem when the problem could have been solved much more directly. But let's not forget Jerry. Jerry, are you sure you need this feature to be bolted on there? Look, we have two tabs back here that are included in the casting. Why couldn't this tab have just been part of the casting? Do we really need that slight variation? And again, by March of 1961, they included that tab in the casting. Look, there is Jerry's hole that he had for the bolted tab. All right, this is something that's a little bit simpler. So what I did was I wanted to figure out if we were building this today, and this was going into a vehicle, and this was completely built by the OEM, what would the cost difference be? All right, so being built with OEM labor today, we have a metal stamping. Now we have to source the metal, we have to stamp, we have to bend the metal. We have the bolt, which is basically a weld stud. We are now purchasing those weld studs, we're pressing them into the stamping, and then we are welding them in place. We are then purchasing nuts, and then an operator has to put these together and then tighten them. Here's the problem. If something can be done wrong, it will be done wrong. There's a possibility of putting that tab on here, which locks it back here. Unless someone is paying attention on the assembly line, there's nothing that's really stopping them from putting that on backwards. So this is now a quality problem. Parts may be rejected if they're accidentally built wrong. This is all one piece. There is no additional labor. There's no additional purchase of material. So I wanted to find out what are my costs? Okay. I calculated this. If it was OEM labor with a volume of 100,000 per year, basically with the purchase of the material and then also paying an operator to install it, you're looking at $1.25 per part. Now there are two of these per vehicle, one that goes on either side of the glove, of the glove box. So that's $2.50 per vehicle. Assuming you're, per, you're building 100,000 vehicles per year, that's a quarter million dollars. Now, in the past, vehicles only lasted one year, and then they had a new design, new design, new design. In today's market, when we design something, especially a hidden bracket, we often want them to stick around for seven years. So if they had made this decision and stuck with it, paying OEM labor, and had this for seven years, you're talking $1.75 million dollars additional cost because of that decision. This is the type of things that we work to identify with them in a row. We tear something down, we work with the customers, we have conversations with those engineers and say, look, you can find something that might be very, very simple, 
or we may find something that's very, very complex. And we try to identify where, where are the costs? What are you spending today? And what could you possibly be spending in the future? Can we achieve the exact same result with something that is much simpler and more cost effective? So we can work through an entire vehicle. We can work through an individual part. Um, and again, I can't speak specifically to customers or to projects that we have worked on in the past, but this is very, very typical of the things that we would identify and try and work with the customer. When we talk directly to those engineers, again, they get very defensive because they know they designed it perfectly per their company's design guidelines. And they've been working for that company for 10 years and they know what happens if they want to build something that's different. They have to fight that battle with their management. They have to prove that it's not going to be a problem with their management. Because if Bob had put his pin here and there was an issue, they're going to blame Bob. Bob does not want them to blame him. But by me talking to them, I can speak directly to the management and I can speak to Bob and they can blame me. I can help to work with them and encourage them saying, Lo, this is a good idea. Here are some past examples of this type of an idea working out well. And we can have that type of discussion back and forth. If they had done this from the beginning, they never would have paid for that stamping tool. They would not have had a line set up in order to put that on. It could have saved a lot of money in the very, very beginning. But because they went into production with this design, they already had to pay for all those tooling. They already have the space on the line. We can change it now, but some of those costs are already sunk in. So some of our customers want us to work with them before they have designed something or after they have designed, before they have built tools. And some of them come to us after they've already built the part, they already see the costs and they say, how can we make it less expensive? And we can have those types of discussions. So I wanted to have this discussion to try and show you how Monroe would work with the customers, with the engineers, with customers management, to help to encourage them to show that cost savings can be achieved even in very, very small areas. Something as tiny as this type of a decision could be worth $1.75 million to a company. Now that justifies quite a lot in the cost that they would pay me as a consultant to help them to identify those savings. And if a decision like this or an issue like this is present in a hundred locations across the vehicle, well, now that is a lot of money that's on the table. So I hope you've gotten a little bit of education in some of the processes that we go through here at Monroe. I hope if you are not subscribed, please subscribe for future videos and have a good day.